Good morning. I want to welcome you all to Smithville Brethren Church. If you've got your bulletin, you can open up and take a look. A couple of things just to highlight. Things are beginning to get back to a little bit of uh, normalcy. Friends Club is going to get together tonight to go skating. The youth group's getting together for a lesson and mud bogging. Hmm. Anyway, uh, we're going to honor our high school and college graduates uh, coming up. You want to take a look at the dates for that. If you've got a high school or college graduate, you want to get information to us soon. The other piece of news is Camp Bethany board met a couple weeks ago and made some shifts or changes to the summer program. And you know, we've been letting you know in the bulletin, here are the dates and here's what's going on. With the possibility of changes, here are the changes. You'll see the adult retreat is postponed. They're not sure whether they're going to have it or not. And then mini camp they're going to have, but to fit into their guidelines, they're not going to be able to let parents go along with the, the child. So if someone has already signed up and they wanted to go with their child and now they can't, they can get a refund if they need to. So uh, otherwise the dates are the same. The only other piece of information from them is they are, may end up having to cap the total number of kids per week. So it would be good to uh, get, get your kids registered early. On our side, the, our church's side, uh, for years we have done uh, we've paid half the early registration fee for our campers to go to camp. And you may have, if you've looked this over, realized uh, that this year, because of a special donation that happened last year, uh, you want to go to camp for a week, it's $25. So the cost is uh, quite, quite reduced. So take a look at that, take advantage of that, uh, get your kids, grandkids, neighbor kids, community kids, whatever, it doesn't matter. Just grab a bunch of kids, sign them up, and we'll send them to camp with their parents' permission. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for our chance to gather to worship you, to celebrate your goodness to us, to see each other face to face and to be able to talk with each other and um, hear the stories of how you are working mightily and how we need to pray for each other. Help us today to take away both the praise of those answered prayers that we hear about as well as the requests that come in the form of concerns, things that are heavy on our hearts as we meet together and as we celebrate. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and invite each other to worship this morning. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. Let's sing together, fairest Lord Jesus.
Thank you. Please be seated if you would. You want to take your copy of God's Word, the Bible, and please turn to Matthew. We're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 28. So Matthew chapter 20. As you're turning there, a little bit of information. This, again, from the Gospel, the biography of Jesus Christ, written by his disciple Matthew, also known as Levi. This is an interesting passage of scripture. We discover that two of Jesus' disciples come to him. They are looking for the preeminent positions in his coming kingdom, and they have brought along their mother to do the dirty work. As you read the story, mom comes, she's asking for her two boys if they can take the number one and number two slots, and you discover that the disciples are absolutely furious at James and John and their mother for pulling off this stunt. When you first read it, you might think that that is because they cannot believe that James and John would be asking for the number one and number two slots. In reality, they were probably upset because they got there first, because the disciples were still arguing at the Last Supper over who should be number one. So as you have turned there, we want to begin in verse 20. We're going to read. I'm reading out of a New International Version. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and, kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. If you would please join me for a word of prayer. Father, as we come to the passage we have read We hear the words of Jesus. Whoever would be great should serve, and the greatest should serve everyone else. Those are shocking words. That is countercultural to everything that humans naturally think. So, Father, our prayer this morning is not only will we see that The kingdom is an upside-down kingdom. It's about service. But, Father, that we would think about how we would serve others. Help us to think through how can we serve in our marriages? How can we serve in our families, in our friendships, at our places of work? We ask that you would make us great in being like Jesus, who served us, who came as the great servant. Father, we lift up a few of your servants from this church who have physical needs. We want to pray for Terry. We ask that you would bring healing to his body with the C. diff that he has, that He could regain his appetite and begin to eat normally again. We want to thank you for good news for Jimmy, but we want to pray that the surgeons will be able to go in and that they will be able to remove all of his cancer and that soon he can be cancer-free. Father, we want to thank you for just a tremendous service yesterday. 
where we could celebrate Jerry's homegoing and how, Father, we heard that he served in his family and in his community. Father, we would pray that we would live in such a way that not only will folks miss us on this side, but that we would hear, well done, good and faithful servant when we make it home. Receive from us our worship for you. Receive our offerings. Receive our time today. And then, Father, make us like Jesus Christ so that we can go out into the community, serve, and see folks come in to Jesus' coming kingdom. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Jesus.
Jesus in my heart. I have to tell the two of you, um, that brings back a lot of great memories, singing those songs growing up. Also brings back another memory, I may have shared it here, but a um, number of years ago, probably a number of decades now, the greatest theologian of the 20th century was at a conference one time. They were interviewing Karl Barth, and they were asking him different questions, and somebody asked him the question, what is the greatest theological thought that you have ever had? Now, this is somebody who wrote hundreds of pages of very seminal work for theologians in the 20th century. A preeminent mind in the field. And the story is, he thought for a moment, and then he said the following. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Amen. It's songs kids sing, right? Deepest theological thoughts. That the God of the universe could choose to love us. How could we do anything less than love him in return? So if you would, let's stand together and we're going to sing joyful, joyful, we adore thee. And Scott mentioned uh, Jerry's funeral yesterday. I thought it would be worth letting you know that if you go to YouTube and you go to Scott Fetter's YouTube channel, you can actually view the entire funeral service. We videoed it, and uh, I know some family have already seen it, but if you are interested in being able to see it, if you were not able to be here with us uh, yesterday, it's, it's available for you. There are a few kinds of training you can receive when you're headed into some new work or some new... Uh, adventure, you can have training that precedes what it is you're going to do. So your company or your organization, they send you out to learn how to do this or that or the other ahead of time, then you get to do it. So it's sort of the, the, the head of, ahead of time kind of training. In the state of Connecticut, if you were going to be a police officer, you had to be hired first by a department, and then a department would send you either to their own police department, if they were, or their own training 
facility if they had one, but mostly they didn't. Or like if you got hired by the state police, you got sent to their police academy, they had their own, which was, well, it's its own separate thing, right? You know how those things work. So anyway, that's how it works. In Ohio, it's a little different, but either way, you can go off to a police academy if you want to be a police officer, and you learn all kinds of things. How to drive really fast, safely. Some of us know how to do the one, but not the other. Uh, how to make arrests, you would learn about the law, you would learn about life-saving procedures, you would learn about the equipment you would have, you would learn how to use your firearm, uh, multiple firearms, various kinds, and all of these things would, would, uh, would be part of the training. And then you would head off to your new position as a police officer, uh, but they don't just let you loose out of the academy, right? They don't just say, you graduated, and so they put you with a field training officer. And the field training officer takes what you learned in the academy and helps you apply it to actually working on the streets. And you will learn what life is really like uh, working. You will learn more about the department. You will learn the ins and outs. And that person will watch over you, critique you, uh, give you more and more responsibility as the time goes on during your training period so that you can get on-the-job training, right? It's not beforehand, it's you're working, but you're still in training and you're still learning. In parenting, uh, we call these moments of on-the-job kind of training um, teachable moments. Something happens and it strikes us, we should talk to our kids about this, right? A piece of news comes our way or, you know, the one I've used before, we, uh, we used to do this when, when our kids were little, We'd be in a store and a child would throw a temper tantrum. And I just want to say, you know, thank you to all of you who had kids who were throwing temper tantrums in public. Ours were always in private, thankfully. But anyway, the ones that were in public, we got to then say, did you see that young boy at the checkout who was screaming about a candy bar? Uh-huh. What did you think of that? That was not good, Daddy. That's right. And what would happen if you did that? I'm not saying. Anyway. Not good things in the, in the short run for the young person in our household. Anyway, those moments come up where some incident happens and you hear about it. You're reading the newspaper. You read about something that, uh, something that happened or a piece of news comes your direction from wherever and you can say to your kids, hey, let's talk about this. Let's talk about this and, and let's get into this. Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 to 28, the disciples get a lesson on things like leadership, ambition, greatness from the perspective of the kingdom of God, not because Jesus opened up his training folder and said, now which lessons have I forgotten to cover so far? It was because something happened, a request, and the response of the other disciples that he said, ah, let us talk about what greatness in the kingdom of God is like. It looks like my disciples need a bit of training here. So let's talk about the ask. I've often wondered about this. Where did this request come from? Did James and John desire status in the kingdom and go to their mother and say, mommy, because if that's what you're doing as an adult, we got to go with mommy. We can't go with mom. Mommy, can you go ask Jesus if we can have these preeminent positions of left and right, the, the most important positions in the kingdom? Can we be in the ruling uh, group? Can we get in even tighter to Jesus so that we can uh, be the ones? Mommy, will you go and do that? You can picture a, a small child, like right? they're, they're grabbing onto their mom's pant and saying, could you ask? Could you ask them? But these aren't children. Small children, I should say. These are adults. So did, did James and John have this desire in them? Because if you know, the, the passage is a little different in the book of Mark. In the book of Mark, mom's not involved. It's just James and John. So from that, it looks like they were the ones prompting this. But the other way is, if we think about maybe Mark left mom out of the deal, maybe it's the mom. Like, raise your hand if you have children and you want what's best for your kids. Hello? And raise your hand if you want what wants, what wants best for your kids. 
and you're willing to ask for it. <laughs> right? That's what she's doing. You're advocating for a kid. Hey, James and John, can we put them on the left? Can we put them on the right? Do, do me a favor. Make them the most important people in the kingdom. That's all I'm looking for, right? Um, parents advocate for their kids. Uh, it doesn't have to be in a rude way. It doesn't have to be in a difficult way. It doesn't have to be inappropriate. But parents, uh, when things come up, uh, sometimes need to step in on behalf of their kids and, and do that kind of thing. Is that mom doing it? Although this one feels more like, uh, I don't know, 35, 40-year-old son who's single out to dinner with his parents. The waitress comes over and the mom asks the waitress out on behalf of her son. That's what it feels like to me. Kind of like inappropriate, right? Jesus, will you do this for them? Did James and John get blindsided by their mother, or was it really their idea? Again, from Mark, it looks like James and John were really interested in this. James and John are there when mom makes the request. All three of them went together to talk to Jesus. The mom takes the appropriate posture in the request, right? Right? She gets down on her knees. It's a sign of submission and reverence to Jesus. She knows her place in the relationship and it takes the appropriate posture. That's part of the ask, right? Sometimes we see the opposite of this in uh, children and their attitude and the way they talk to their parents and demand things uh, from them. But we don't see this in, in James and John or their mother there's also the idea that the mother makes the request to the person that she thinks can grant the request. So she didn't pull the other disciples and say, can we vote James and John in for the top two spots? Can we have a contest of some sort and hopefully they'll win? No, she just goes to Jesus. Now later Jesus is going to say that's really not my place. It's the, the place of the father, but she is going to the right place. In verse 21, Jesus says, what is it that you want? I find that to be an encouraging statement. Jesus is interested in hearing the request of this mother. When in desperate situations we go to him and we ask for healing for a loved one or we go with a request to ask him to change the heart of someone we're close to, he wants to hear our request. Jesus isn't too busy to hear the request of James and John's mother. We have an open door. We can take our requests, our asks, our prayers, as it were. Whether it's a life relational issue or a medical issue or a spiritual development issue or a character issue. In this case, their mother, as I've indicated, I think uh, wanted something from Jesus and so Ask for these seats of honor in the kingdom of God. That's what she's looking for. It's a bold request, no doubt. And I think it's important for us to boldly ask God for what we desire. Uh, they're being, uh, Jesus is being asked for these positions right and left, these places of honor. It would be like uh, always sitting at the captain's table during a cruise, right? I always want to be in the position or at the banquet where the Queen of England is. I want to sit on her left or her right. I want to be in that position. There's only two sides, only one left, one right, and that's where I want to be. And it's interesting to me, if you think about James and John, John, who's the other disciple we often say with James and John, it starts with Peter. So James and John and their mother are sort of edging out Peter. I know you three are close, but... Boys, we need to take the top two spots. I want you to do me a favor. Treat my kids to the best position. I want you to do me a favor and make them the most important humans on the earth for this time. It's a bold request. But that's exactly how God wants us to pray, boldly. We are called to go boldly before the throne of grace. To bring the requests we have, no matter what they are, unvarnished, unfigured out, un. Uh, 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 it, where we haven't sort of sorted it all out necessarily. We would just go to him and say, here is my request. So today, do you sit here having a bold request? Are you carrying a load or a concern for someone? Maybe it's yourself or others. Do you want healing? Do you want someone else healed? Do you want God to do something particular in your life? Then I think we can look at James and John and their mom 
For as much as we can poke fun at what they did or how they did it, they boldly went to Jesus. Now, a side note. Are you thankful that your actions are not recorded in the Bible for all of Christendom to read about? Amen. I'm in, right? What if every prayer I ever prayed, or just a select few of petty, nonsensical, selfish prayers that I have prayed through the years, were recorded? Right? That would be embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, whoops is right. Yeah. Ooh, sorry. But God wants us to come boldly, unvarnished. He's not offended by our asks. He's not offended by our requests. He may redirect them. He may, we'll get to the response here, but he's not offended by them. So go and ask God for what you want. And here's something that will happen. Some of the time when you ask God for what you want, God will grant it. And then you get to rejoice. Here's the response. Uh, in terms of bold requests, the mother and the two sons have hit it out of the park, giving the honored positions, right? Jesus' response is essentially to say to them, or says to them, you don't really know what you're asking for, right? He says, can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? The question is meant to get the sons to think about what it means to be in an honored position in the kingdom. It is not the place where you sit back and get served, it is not honor, position, life like the world expresses honored position. Their response is as bold as the question that the mom asks. Yes, we can. We got this. Right? I, I, I find it interesting, right? There's nothing wrong with being bold. There's something wrong with being ignorant. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with being bold in response. They believe they can. Jesus then says, yeah, you will. Acts 12 records, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death by the sword. Jesus is saying, are you going to take on the cup of suffering and serving and giving of your life like I am? They respond, yeah, we will. They don't really know what they're talking about. And then they do. James dies by the sword. John is exiled. They have to pay. You'll experience martyrdom. You'll be killed for the cause. You don't know it at this point. Your confidence is based in ignorance, but it turns out you will, in fact, experience this kind of suffering. And then it turns out that the request they make is not really to the right person. Jesus redirects him to the Father. This is not my area. This is not my call. It is the Father's call. As I was studying this passage, I was thinking about the connection between this passage and the trouble we face when we have unanswered prayers. We ask God to do something, to intervene in a situation. We might boldly ask like James and John and their mother do, but we must be ready for the response of Jesus. Here it is the question, does my asking of God require him to do what I've, asked me, what I've asked him to do? Now, if we go around in our Bibles, we might be able to support the idea that if you just ask, God will do it for you. In fact, it sounds almost biblical. John 14, 4, you may ask for me anything in my name and I will do it. Those are Jesus' words. And you think, jackpot, that's a verse you put on your refrigerator, that's one you show up on your screen. That's one you want to paste near your checkbook, wherever you want it, you know, on your mirror in the bathroom. Woohoo! All I got to do is ask. Forget the part about in my name, but all I got to do, that's the only part we remember. All I got to do is ask. And God functions like a genie. All I do is ask, right? Maybe I have to rub the Bible. And he'll do it. But that's not how it works. We know that's not how it works. All of us here today have asked for something we believe is in God's will and in line with what God desires, and God hasn't done it. Here, James and John and their mother ask for something. They want something from James and John, but they are asking in a way that the book of James talks about in chapter for what causes fights and quarrels among you? Do they not come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill, you covet, you can't get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. 
You don't have because you haven't asked. Well, they've asked. You've asked and don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. It's a financial request. Meet my needs, find my needs, you know, but provide me wealth and what I need. And, and, and James is saying, you're not going to get it because God knows your heart and knows what you're going to do with it. And it's an inappropriate motive in your heart. Jesus is putting a pause on the ask from James and John and their mother. First by saying, it's not my place, it's the father's. But the other reality is, why, what is their motivation? What is in their hearts? Why do we want prestige and power? Sometimes it's because we want to be in control. We want to be in control. We want to be able to be the one in the driver's seat. Uh, through the years, people have told me uh, time and time again that it is always God's will that everyone be healed. And if you're not healed, it's because you don't have enough faith. Or God wants all his disciples, his followers to be wealthy. And if you don't have wealth, it's because you lack faith. And these are things that do not stand up to scrutiny from the scriptures. Wealth and health are both blessings of God, to be sure, but they are not the only blessings, and they are not the preeminent blessings, and they are not necessarily for everyone. There are times in our lives when we pray, when we desire to have, and God does not grant our request. Sometimes we get a delay in the response. Sometimes it's a wait. Sometimes it's a no. But this passage reminds us that God is the one who gets to decide. We get to boldly ask. We're told to ask. But that doesn't guarantee that we will get what we desire. Then comes the specific lesson related to the ask. So James and John and their mother make this request. We want the honored positions in the kingdom. And then I've wondered, did the other ten disciples hear this as it was happening? Was this like in a gathering and they kind of overheard? Or did they hear about it through James and John saying something? Or one of them heard and told the rest? But however it came to be, Jesus calls them all together and decides he's going to give them a lesson. An on-the-job training, just-in-time, teachable moment. Right? And as Scott said, many commentators have said through the years, uh, they've long suspected that the, the response of the, uh, the other disciples, it says they were indignant. That means like super mad, right? They're super mad. They're red face mad. They're indignant because, not because they have pure motives or not because they understand greatness and they understand the gravity of the question or the, the request. They're indignant because they're getting edged out by James and John. Children sometimes ask questions that they shouldn't. They might see someone uh, who's uh, uh, someone and they... Uh, they look at somebody who has something that they like and they say, well, what did that cost you? you know, parents might get a little upset at that and say, oh, don't do that. James and John ask the question. It's not the 10 disciples said, oh, boys, you shouldn't have said that. You shouldn't have asked that. That's inappropriate. That's outside the bounds. That's being too bold or too arrogant. No, no. We didn't think of it first. Or maybe we thought of it, but we didn't have the courage to ask. And again, Peter, Peter, James, and John are at the transfiguration. Peter, James, and John are the inner circle. How did Peter feel in particular about James and John kind of edging them out? Kingsbury, a commentator, contends that the ten are indignant not because their motives are purer, but because they covet these same positions of honor. Another writer says the other disciples are angry not because they have a different attitude towards greatness, but because they want the top spots themselves. Jesus seizes on this moment and brings a lesson about greatness the world's view of greatness involves accolades, the best seat in the house, privileged position, perks that everyone expects to go to that person who's in that position. And Jesus says clearly that is not the way of the kingdom of God. If you want to be great, you must be the servant of all. You must not mimic the pattern of the world. You must mimic the life of of Jesus. Jesus was the greatest in the kingdom and he gave his life as a ransom for many. It was not the accumulation of praises of men that made him great. It was his willingness to lay down his life for others. 
In the kingdom, we need to be concerned for the opportunities to serve more than the benefits of anything that we might receive. We need to be people who give up for the benefit of others and to look not only at our own interests, as Paul says in Philippians, but to the interests of others. But the worldly mindset of greatness more than just creeps into the life of the church. It creeped into the disciples because it was part of their sin nature. Jesus, uh, as they, as she's be, he's being asked by the mom, are encountering a worldly sense of leadership desire. We want the privileged positions at the exclusion of the rest of these folks. We want greatness. That's not the problem. It's their definition of greatness. If the disciples said to Jesus, we would like to be the servants of all, we'd like to be the bottom of the barrel, give us the worst tasks, the most menial jobs, the terrible things to do, Jesus probably would have gathered them together and said, these two and their mom have it figured out. One writer said, few models are more desperately needed in an age of celebrity Christianity, high-tech evangelism and worship, and widespread abuse of ecclesiastical power for self Engrandizement. Speaking about the church, the church needs the model of Jesus' leadership held up because it's a widespread problem. I, I've shared these before, I think, but um, some time ago, uh, a, a, a pastor named Creflo Dollars, I believe is how you say his name, uh, pled with his congregation to make contributions so that he could buy a new jet. That's an airplane, by the way, jet, jet airplane. I would take just a prop plane, that'd be fine. He didn't want just a plane, he wanted a G650, which if you know airplanes, it's kind of a upper end private jet, um, price tag somewhere at the time of about 65 million. 65 million U.S. dollars, not Canadian dollars, right? U.S. dollars. Jesse Duplantis, another uh, famous pastor who ends up on TV, um, he had more modest desires. He was only looking for 54 million for his plane to upgrade. Uh, One reporter uh, was reporting on these kinds of excesses in the church, and they described a a trip that was taken by a pastor on his private jet, and they estimated that it cost $14,000 to fly from where he was to where he was going, within the United States, based on, I don't know how they uh, figured it all out, the cost of the plane and the cost of the fuel and the people flying it and all this kind of stuff. Uh, And they said it would have cost about $180 if he had flown commercial, but who could do that? I mean, who who can fly commercial, right? Who, Who can get on a regular airplane and be with regular people? One person said flying commercial was like flying in a tube with a bunch of demons. That was a pastor, by the way. Hmm. Jesus had meals intentionally with tax collectors and sinners. I'm sorry. That's what it's recorded in the Bible I read. And this fellow says, essentially, I can't fly commercial because I can't be around these people. Right? It's, a, it's the world's sense of greatness and privilege that is more than crept into the church. Leadership in the kingdom of God is not about perks and recognition. It is always about serving. I have to tell you, just honestly, you know, kind of bring it back down to earth, right? When I am at other churches and I see that there's a parking sign that says, for the pastor, I want to hook a chain to it in my truck and rip it out of the ground. Right? Unless the pastor has trouble getting in and out of the building. Right? If it's sort of like a, they, they have trouble moving around and that's a helpful thing for them, that's great. But if it's, if it's about privilege, I want to jerk it out of the ground. Actually, I'd like to take it out of the ground gently and, and find the farthest place in the whole uh, uh, parking facility and then plant it over there, right? I get to go to Worcester Hospital, right? When this pandemic's over, we'll be back being able to visit folks. They have clergy parking at Worcester Hospital. It's too, it's out by the road. It's, it's not up by the building. It's not near the handicap spots. It's, it's away from, it's near an entrance, sort of, kind of, but not even really. 
It's just there because they know we're going to end up over there, and so they give us a couple of spots. Great. But when the church behaves like leadership is about privilege and perks and honor in the ways that the world does, we are missing the boat. <laughs> Jesus, in the midst of a meal, washes the feet of the disciples and then says, now that I've done it, you do the same. He does not sit at the meal and say, you yahoos, nobody washed my feet. Somebody ought to get up and wash my feet. Greatness in the kingdom is about serving. And let's bring it home. Let's think about how we serve in our homes. Let's think how we serve in our communities, in our places of work. You got chores to do as a family, and, and there's a, a number of children involved in the chores. Let's stop asking whose responsibility it was in this moment and just get it done. If you're the CEO of a company and you drive into your parking lot and you see trash in a parking space, do you call someone up and say, get this out of here? Or do you open your door and throw it in your car so that you can dispose of it? We should be oriented towards serving, not towards being served wherever we are. That's the lesson Jesus wants to drive home to the people he's going to hand over leadership in the church to. And it's the same lesson all of us need in our context every day. Father, thank you that you teach us in the midst of our life. Thank you that you want us to come before you boldly. You want us to make requests, but you love us enough not to answer them in the way that we want often. And you are in charge and you know what you're doing and we don't always understand. And so we come to you with requests, but we submit ourselves to you and wait for your response. Help us, Father, to be servants, servants of all. In Jesus' name, amen. If we love Jesus, we will obey him. Let's stand and sing in closing, my Jesus, I love thee.
Father, help us to uh, just be reminded that loving you means obeying you, loving means serving you, and serving the people that you have put in our circle of influence, the people around us, wherever we are. Help us to leave this place with a renewed desire to be your servants in this world and to demonstrate who you are by how we live. In Jesus' name, amen.